Good afternoon from beautiful Barcelona. I am Alexis Roch, CEO of SciTech Diplo Hub, the Barcelona Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Thank you so much for joining us one more week at this series of five online seminars that SciTech Diplo Hub has put forward together with other world-class institutions with leading international experts in science diplomacy, geopolitics, technology, and global health. Last week, we gathered experts in European affairs, international relations, and science diplomacy to explore the impact of COVID-19 on European governance and integration and the opportunities for science diplomacy in the EU in light of the current pandemic. In case you missed it, you can watch it now on our YouTube channel. Today, we'll discuss the role of global cities and urban innovation ecosystems in global health crisis and the scientific contributions of Barcelona to tackle this emergency. Along the human history, many of the most relevant advances in urban management were developed in response to public health crisis. From the plague of Athens in 4030 BC, which wrought profound changes in the city laws and identity, to the Black Death in the Middle Ages, which transformed the balance of class power in European societies, public health crises seldom failed to leave their mark on cities and their policy strategies. Today, COVID-19 is joining a long list of more recent infectious diseases, such as the Spanish flu at 1918 or the Ebola virus disease in 2014, which left enduring changes on urban spaces. As the world continues to fight the rapid spread of coronavirus, confining many people at home and radi radically reshaping the way we move through working and, and, and think about our cities, some are wondering which of these changes will persist beyond the end of the pandemic and what life might look like on the other side. At the same time, cities across borders and their research and innovation ecosystems are fostering collective responses by sharing data, scientific knowledge and best practices through joint initiatives, such as, for example, Cities for Global Health, an online platform led by Metropolis and other major city networks and which we are proud of being part of. Actually, in 2018, Barcelona became the world's first city to deploy a science diplomacy strategy, leveraging the potential of the city's knowledge and innovation ecosystem for global public goods. Backed by living research centers, universities, nonprofits, startups, corporations, and public institutions, at SciTech DiploHub, we have positioned Barcelona as a global laboratory in science and technology diplomacy for cities and countries around the world. So, how can other cities deploy their science diplomacy strategies to deal with global health crisis? What initiatives and policies are currently being developed at the local level in response to the COVID-19 outbreak? How will urban planners and governments resolve the apparent tension between densification, the push towards cities becoming more concentrated, which is seen as essential to improving environmental sustainability, and desegregation, which is one of the key tools currently being used to hold back infection transmission? How can digital infrastructures help local governance harness data to tackle the current health crisis? What is the global contribution of Barcelona's research groups and companies to the COVID-19 pandemic? To shed light on some of these questions today, we are delighted to welcome four world-class experts in city diplomacy, urban innovation, bioinformatics, and microbiology, who will be moderated by Miquel Molina, Deputy Director of the newspaper La Vanguardia. Miquel, good afternoon, buena tarde. Good afternoon, everyone, buena tarde. It's really a challenge for me to be here moderating this debate on cities uh, at, a, at a very difficult time, at a, a time as complex as, as, as this one is. I mean, this is a, a crisis. Uh, um, we, we are facing a, a real urban crisis because this is a crisis that was originated, started in a Chinese city, a crisis which traveled uh, through global cities. And it's a crisis that has reached its maximum level of development in, in the urban environment. Uh, this 21st century was meant to be the, the century of cities. But suddenly we have also discovered the dark side of uh, concepts very linked to, to cities. I'm talking about uh, concepts like connectivity or density, which are very urban concepts, but now we have seen that in a certain way they are opposed, opposed, opposed to the idea of, of health, uh, as we have all realized these very tragic days. We have also known the, the very worst phase of, of, of cities. The, I, I, I'm referring to the, the 
predatory uh, behavior of, of cities towards the, the rural uh, environment, the, the metropolitan environment. The same night that the Italian government uh, ordered the lockdown of, of Milan, uh, we, we knew, we, 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 see, we, we saw that, that um, 20,000 Milanese fled the cities and spread the virus all over Italy. We have seen uh, similar behaviors in Barcelona, in Madrid, in Paris and, and New York City, everywhere. Uh, this this kind of behavior, uh, even if 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 it only corresponds to a, a minority of of the of the, of the population of these cities, uh, I'm sure it will spoil the relationship between the city and the rest of the metro areas for a long time. But on the other hand, we have also witnessed an explosion of creativity in this in crisis in the cities. We have seen, for example, how the, the, cult, the culture sector is amusing and supporting massively the, the confined citizens everywhere. Some artists are doing it uh, in a streaming uh, online. Another are uh, doing it live with their performance uh, every afternoon at 8, uh, 8 p.m. In, in our balconies, uh, our balconies everywhere in the world. And then there are the cities which are joining efforts to fight the pandemic. These such as Barcelona, networks for exchanging experiences in the field of research and innovation. This site tech Diplo Hub streaming session is a very good example of this. And the people who are here today with us are very good representatives uh, of the talent that is uh, generated in a, in a global city and can and should have a, a global impact. Uh, this crisis uh, will seriously affect the economic sector, uh, which is the, 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 the most important sector uh, in Barcelona, which is tourism, as, as uh, all of us know. Uh, it will be very interesting to get to know uh, at the end of this webinar, to what extent do you think that technology, science, biomedical research should, should be uh, from now on the main strategic commitment uh, for a city like Barcelona? Uh, so, our guests today are uh, uh, Emilia Saiz, uh, Secretary General of the United Cities and Local Governments, Esteban Mirall, uh, Director of the Center for Innovation in Cities in Nesade, the Business School, uh, Alfonso Valencia, Director of Life, uh, Life Science Department at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and Laura Lechuga, who is uh, the leader of the nanobiosensors and bioanalytical application groups or group at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Uh, we will start with, with Emilia Saez. Uh, first question. Uh, COVID-19 certainly poses some fundamental challenges to urban design and governments. Uh, when it comes to infectious, infectious disease outbreaks, cities are dual-aged. Uh, as we said before, uh, densely populated and hyperconnected cities intensify the spread and transmission of infectious disease through increased human contact. At the same time, cities play a central role in preparing for mitigating and adapting the pandemics. What initiatives and policies are being developed at the local level in response to the COVID-19 outbreak? What is the role of global cities and how do these cities interact with peri-urban areas such as Wuhan or Bavaria? How can we ensure rapid urban growth is accompanied by the appropriate development of social and technical infrastructures? It's your turn, Emilia. <laughs> Here you are, Emilia. You can hear me? Well, while we are trying to, to, to find a solution to this problem, Emilia, are you here? 
we can go to, to the next one and, and change the order. Uh, Esteban Miral, my question for you is uh, cities such as Barcelona have built in recent years uh, strong digital capabilities and technology ecosystems becoming uh, so-called uh, what we call smart cities. How relevant is uh, urban digital governance, governance in the light of uh, COVID-19 and how can it be improved? Which cities are already on the edge uh, deploying their own digital infrastructures to preparing for mitigating and adapt adapting to pandemics and what can we learn for them? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much Alexis and Matthias and so on for all this question. I was thinking what I can say about cities, about the whole of cities and in general about this pandemic that has not been said. I mean, so many things have been said. So I thought about only a few things. I thought about talking about this uh, great divide. I thought talking about how to lower the pain uh, of so much pain in, in now in, in cities and everywhere, people dying and so on. And talking about the opportunity that we will have after the pandemic or the opportunity, how can we size this opportunity after things happen? But before that, uh, let me say a few things about the crisis. I mean, many times people equate this crisis to a war. But come on, virus don't have a command and control center. And virus are not centralized. Uh, this is not a normal war. Uh, this is a fight that depends on our ability to detect and detect early who is infected, to isolate and to find all the chain of contacts that these people may have been with. Once we have that, depends on our ability of aggregating this data and with this data making models to predict what is going to happen and where is going to happen all these things. <clears throat> all this uh, has a lot to do with data, has a lot to do with our capacity of deal with data and have an exact uh, uh, an accurate estimate of what is happening and what could happen in the next days. So this is probably a better capacity that we need and a better uh, analogy than equating that uh, to a world. Maybe it's a world, but it's a world with data. Uh, and this links to the, the first thing, the great divide. We have seen one kind of cities, territories, <coughs> that uh, have digital infrastructures that are prepared to deal with this data, that immediately put in place apps and know who is infected, who is not, what are the big things or not. We have seen that in China. We have seen that in Singapore, in Taiwan, in South Korea. And we have seen cities and territories who don't, who have to fight these epidemics the same way that we did in the 14th century, in the 17th century, when Newton suffered this and uh, uh, similar epidemics. This is a huge divide, a huge divide that talks about how cities can use this data in order to have a general understanding of this data. There is interesting things about these apps. One interesting thing is what they built upon. They built upon the, uh, the willingness of people not to be infected. It's not only a big brother apps that are there and so on, of course, it's part of big brother apps. But when in China, somebody has the green thing and when the, the, the green in the, in the app and then to go, to a, go to a place and the place is red, well, it deals that uh, you don't want to be infected. You don't want to enter this place. And the same, so it's very general, it's very decentralized in, in, many, in many ways. Uh, this is one of the interesting things that we have. The second thing that I wanted to talk, it's about how we lower the pain and how can we get out of this uh, crisis and how can we get out better. Of course, there are universal measures. I mean, universal basic income is coming to date finally, and it seems to be one universal measure. But we also have things that are very granular. And these things is who needs healthcare who needs a, a social uh, wave, who needs an economic help, uh, who needs all these kind of things, and who don't, who doesn't. And again, for understanding and addressing these things in a big annual day, 
in a very granular way, we need data. It's again the crisis of data. And the last thing that I wanted to talk, it's about the opportunity of this crisis. Uh, an obvious opportunity is to build all these digital infrastructures that we don't have. And if we had, things would have been much better than the ones that have been uh, right now. But another thing is realizing that there are many things that are happening in our society. For example, we have been talking before of the switching cost of getting online. For universities like us, that we now everybody is online. Now the switching costs are smashed, they disappear. Things like the architectural inertia, oh, I don't want to go online, oh, we have all these procedures, you have to follow these procedures and so on. This architectural inertia is also disappear. Songs like behavioral change, the need to change and have and use all these kind of tools and many other tools that we are using now normally. All this has been instant. Everybody uses them. This provides an opportunity of testing new things, of using new things, of testing a new way of life. The same happened at the social level with the uh, universal basic income that we mentioned before. This is an opportunity for change that is kind of unique at organizational level, at city level, at societal level. So it's a thing that we cannot waste. And my, my final message is, please don't waste this crisis. So many people died. Don't waste it. Let me tell you that we have people attending this uh, webinar from, I can read now, uh, Sweden, Panama, USA, Spain, of course. Uh, let's try again to reach uh, Emilia. Emilia, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Hi, Emilia. I cannot hear the moderator. Yes. We can hear you, Emilia. Yes. Okay, but I, I'm i not hearing anybody else. So I, I haven't heard the question that has been addressed to me. I can speak of my gaff and, and, and just follow the questions that you have asked me in advance. Okay. Let's do it. Shall I do that? Yes, like okay. this. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for the inspiring uh, first uh, inputs, uh, Esteve. I cannot agree with you more. Um, we cannot waste uh, this, this crisis. And the thing is that from my perspective, this crisis is like, um, it's a magnifying glass of uh, many of the gaps that we knew we had in the governance system. And, and it's, it's proving to us that we need to do a much bigger investment in certain parts of the public sector, because without it, we will not be able to, uh, to face whatever crisis come next, eh? because we are facing a health crisis, but there might, we are also facing environmental crisis, we are facing social crisis. I mean, it's incredible how when you inform about something in a certain way, you identify it like a crisis immediately. But maybe we could have been talking, for instance, about the lack of housing for such a high percentage of the world population also as a very significant price, uh, crisis. We chose not to do it. The same thing we did with the climate emergency. Until very recently, we chose not to talk about it like a crisis. So I think um, this is something that we need to consider and I don't think the world will look uh, like, like before. If we are smart, it will look better. If we don't do well, it might look even worse. Now, on what it can be done from, from the city's perspective, because this is what I come uh, to, to represent here as a worldwide association of cities and, and local governments. Um, I think cities need to demonstrate both their weakness and their power. 
the important role that they need to play as the backbone of the service provision that is keeping our civilization going as we know it. No matter whether it is doing, we are doing well or bad, everywhere in the world you have local leadership that is trying to keep order, that is trying to keep the cities, the local governments, even the towns and the villages going. And they do that uh, in a moment where they know that the type of services that they provide are not maybe the core services that we need to attend to because health is in the first uh, place. But let's be realistic. Health measures without water access, without transportation, without waste management are very, very difficult to keep. And so local government cities around the world, those global cities that you always talk about here, uh, have a very important role to take because in some cases they have the competencies, in many cases they don't, but they are still taking the responsibility. And at the end of the crisis, what they certainly need to have is also the capacities. Capacities are lacking in many of our cities around the world, but also the level of involvement of the cities, of local governments in the dialogues that we need to take efficient message is also lacking. They are not at the table where they should be that we need to take emergency measures uh, in, in terms of, of, of governance should not imply a total centralization of decision making. We need these cities to lead their responses because at the end of the day, they are the ones. I am hearing myself. So. I'm not sure where you are uh, in in what I am saying. We, we, we're going to hear yes, you, yes. Emilia. Yes, we're going to hear you. Okay. Yes, yes. So, um, I, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. I think yes, I am with. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're going yes, to hear you, Emilia. Can, Go, ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. My my last my last point is my last point is we need to ensure that that we need we need to ensure that communities are much more involved in the type of solutions that we find for the future and city diplomacy for us is transformative diplomacy. It's about changing the systems that, that we are using. So I leave you with those thoughts, and if I can come back, I will. But I have a very difficult return uh, of audio, so I hope that you caught my message. Thank you, Emilia. We, we, we were able uh, now we are moving to Alfonso Valencia. Uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is taking the lead in the global uh, scientific effort to, to tackle uh, COVID-19. Uh, BSC is a great example of how uh, bioinformatics is today a crucial tool in global health, as well as uh, in drug uh, development. Uh, how is your department contributing to, to, to finding therapeutics, therapeutic solutions to, to the virus? How are research groups working together across borders in the light of the pandemic? And finally, how, how is the, the outbreak igniting uh, new international collaboration among, among the scientific uh, community? Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the for the questions. So the BSC is a, is a as you say it is a large research infrastructure. We have one of the largest computers in the world, and also it's a research center 
essentially dedicated to manipulating data. As I mentioned, data is the is, is the key for, for all that we do. So in the in the case of the life science department, we are uh, dealing with data models uh, and uh, systems to, uh, to interpret the data, biological data. I would say at two different levels, we are building the infrastructure, the way of manipulating the data and then using this data in specific cases, in this case for the for the for the pandemic, uh, developing uh, drugs, antibodies as therapeutics or vaccines in the future. So our activity is very much at these two levels of the developing the way of organizing biological information and then applying these to specific cases. I would say I have uh, three points uh, in relation to your questions and uh, three, three interesting situations that are uh, now more obvious than before, even if probably they were already there before. One is the, the contrast between the, uh, the local and the uh, research environments. So on the one hand, this uh, is becoming an interesting opportunity uh, for establishing new local contacts. So we have a very interesting project going on uh, with other local institutes because they are the neighbors, they are common interests, they are local financing for this project. So we are the, the, the crisis is uh, like a good way of uh, reinitiating collaboration and then working very hard, very closely with your uh, colleagues in other institutions around the city. And Barcelona is a great place to do that because we have a great research environment. We have the hospitals, we have the research institutions, we have the, the big infrastructures. So that's, that's the local environment and it's very good. At the same time, everything that we do is part of the international research environment. We are part of the international collaborations, mainly with other European countries, uh, other with, uh, with, the, with the United States mainly. So I, 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 know I enjoy this, uh, these two different levels, the very close collaboration with the other uh, research group around the city and that is, in a sense, a very natural connection. And at the same time, all what we do is embedded in this large environment, European environment. And now this is this has always been true, but now uh, trying to, to accelerate research, this become like more obvious, more intense, and, uh, and at the same time has been a great time for sharing data. Now all what we do, whatever is in the local environment or in the international environment, is done completely open this full effort, international effort for everyone to make the papers as to be pub, uh, public as soon as possible, all the data to be open, distribute the data to everyone. So uh, for me, this has been a uh, very uh, interesting and stimulating experience in science diplomacy, how we are uh, connecting with other scientists with no problems, with no barriers. So that's my, friend, my first point about the the importance of the local collaborations and the international collaborations and how important to do open science is. My second point is about uh, data and has already been mentioned before. Uh, data is, uh, is there, we have the methods to do amazing things, we have the instruments to do amazing things, the scientists and the science to do amazing things, but it's extremely difficult to find the data for some of the things that we need. And this, as the crisis is uh, mounting, becomes more obvious. Uh, accessing the health data is very difficult. Accessing the communication data, the, the cell phone data is very difficult. There are good reasons, ethical reasons, uh, legal reasons for all that. But at the same time, without data, we cannot do progress. So for me, this, uh, we knew that before, obviously, but now we are, with the urgency of the case becomes really a pressing need. We need the data and we need the uh, systems to be able to, to use the data. Clearly, this is, in, in my opinion, showing a difference of the 21th century between the countries and the organizations that can solve these problems of accessing data and organizing the data and the one that cannot access the data. So I think that this is going to mark in the history of humanity, a clear division of, we have the instruments, we have the way of doing things, but we need the, being able to access the data and that's become the real, uh, the real challenge for us uh, in these days. So I, I would say this, uh, this point of uh, 
access to the data is my second point. My third point is about the scale of time of science. Now, when things uh, are urgent, we look back to the scientists and uh, everybody's, uh, there are news on the, about science every day in the newspaper, all this interest in science. Uh, but science has a, a, a time and a method, and we cannot produce miracles from one day to the other. So there are things that can, you know, we do all what we can to accelerate things, but there is a limit to what uh, uh, things, uh, uh, things can be done on time. So I this, this, uh, the, the order of time of science, of science I think, is, uh, is something we have, to, we have to be aware of and uh, we have to be very careful about how we communicate science to the society, not creating expectations that are not reasonable in time and, and form. So my, my, my third point uh, is about the importance of considering science always. Only science can get us out of this mess, but uh, science has a time and a mode, and uh, we cannot work outside the times and mode of science. And uh, communicating this is not a trivial, is not a trivial question, but I think it's a, a very important question. So science diplomacy, access to the data, and uh, time and mode of science uh, will be my three points. Thank, Thank you. you, Alfonso, for, for your answers. Uh, let's move. Uh, we have we have people attending us from Brasilia, Mexico, Mexico City, um, Quito, and also Washington DC. It's exciting to 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 realize how how many people are, are interested in this in this. Uh, issue about uh, global global cities. Now we are moving to our our next panelist, who is Laura Lechuga. Uh, Dr. Lechuga is a leading is leading the C the C O N V A T project at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, which is aimed to develop a point of care platform for rapid diagnosis and monitoring mo monitoring of uh, coronavirus. She is collaborating with other research centers at Italy and France within the Horizon 2020 framework. Uh, my question is, uh, at what stage is the project at, at this moment? Uh, how can nanotechnology help diagnosis of infectious disease? Uh, what is the role of interdisciplinary collaboration and how can this be fostered within urban innovation <laughs> ecosystems? Okay. Well, hello, hello to everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. And so I just want to, to say that this um, the COMBAT project, so this is much more easy to say COMBAT. Uh, COMBAT project is one of the first uh, European projects that has been funded uh, to combat and to make this the fast diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, uh, so the main idea of our project is by combining this collaboration with France, Italy, and also another people here in Barcelona, is to be able to, de to deploy a very fast system for the di diagnosis of the COVID-19. So probably all of you know by now that the main technique to, uh, to detect uh, the disease is using PCR, this is a genetic analysis. And then the main problem with this is a very good technique, an excellent technique, but the main problem is you need to do just in a centralized laboratory, it takes many hours, and you need a specialized people to do that. So uh, what, what the scientists, what we are trying to do is just to develop rapid tests where you are able just to deploy this test, not in the central hospital. You can go, I mean, even to the doctor office, even at, at a small place where you can make, make the analysis. So this is the main objective of our project. So I would like to say that uh, even now, there are, as far as I know, there are more than 240 uh, companies uh, trying to commercialize or even commercializing all these rapid tests. But probably you have uh, seen also on the news what happened with the rapid tests that Spain bought and also in the UK, that all of them are failing. And I think as my colleague said previously that the science cannot do miracles, so we cannot do these rapid tests 
so fast because we need to do it in a very reliable way. So we have to control what we are doing in our project is to be able to control the selectivity, the sensitivity. I mean, to be sure what we're doing is really, really a reliable analysis. Uh, so the project just started one month ago, uh, just at the beginning of March. So we are heavily, heavily working here in the lab. We are not under confinement. So all my people is now, even now in the lab working on, on this approach. But in any case, uh, we need to develop with nanotechnology this very powerful platform where you can make this analysis of the, on the people. I mean, to know what is the viral load of the people in a very direct uh, way. But in any case, I'd like also to say that in a, it's an European project. Of course, we have these uh, collaborators, but it's very important to have this multidisciplinary collaboration because, for example, my main background is in physics and technology, but then the other partners in my, in my project, they have this expertise in coronavirus. And an emergency virus. So this is really, really important when you want to design a diagnostic test that is really effective and have the selectivity and the sensitivity enough to be to be used uh, for human use. Uh, so, and another thing that I want to highlight is also about the urban innovation ecosystem. So we are also lucky to be here in Barcelona, where we have a very excellent um, uh, scientific environment. And for example, even if uh, we are working in this European project with my European colleagues, we are just establishing just now, for example, collaboration with other colleagues in Barcelona, with the Valdebron Hospital, with the Clinic Hospital, and also with other people just that they are just developing biomarker, developing any kind of uh, biological molecule that have been of interest in our devices. So it's really, really very interesting to be here because we are so connected and then we can work all together. That is really, really foster much more the scientific development working in this ecosystem and especially in cities like, for example, we are uh, now in Barcelona. Okay. Say welcome to people who are, who are connected to from Albania, Stockholm, uh, Tokyo, Colombia, uh, and we are moving to to Barcelona as as the as the issue as, as an issue for for the the next uh, part of our debate. Um, most of you have mentioned the, the importance of working in uh, in environment uh, in environment like this in Barcelona for developing for developing your your work. Uh, I have a question for uh, all our four panelists, which is, uh, you know, Barcelona became in, in, in 2018 the first city to design and implement a science and technology diplomacy. Why, why do you think is it important to elevate the role of science, technology and cities in international affair, affairs to better address global issues such as uh, COVID-19? What are the main opportunities for Barcelona's innovation ecosystem and what could other cities learn from its science diplomacy strategy in the, the, the context of this uh, crisis? We can, we can keep the, the same order than before. So uh, my first question would be addressed to uh, Emilia, Emilia Saif. Hello, Emilia. Can you hear us? I think we had the same the same problem that than before. Well, we can waiting for for Emilia to to reach us. We can go to to Esteban Miral like, like we did before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, thank, I think it's a very it's a very interesting question. I mean, it has to do with the way we compete. In the past, companies and organizations and countries compete with efficiency, with productivity. Now, compete doing the same things better. Now we compete mostly with innovation. We compete doing new things. We compete with novel proposals. And there are two, two sources of novel proposals. The first one is recombination, recombination of the things that you have. And for that, you need people that have the capacity and so on. But the second one is to produce new things. And these new things come from somewhere. And this somewhere is science. They don't come from the outer space. They are new discoveries from science. All these recombinations and all these capacities need to be connected. 
as much as you are connected, you will be able to produce new capacities and to compete better. And to have competing better is, is not only about getting money, it's about a better life, it's about a better social welfare for everybody. Competing better, it's about a better society for everybody. And that's why now I think it's more important than ever uh, to be leading on innovation, because innovation is the future. And not this is not productivity, it's not innovation, is the way that we define how our society is going to be in the next. And for this, the two elements, science and connectivity, are basic, basic elements, basic building blocks. Without them, we are not going to go anywhere. Alfonso, it's up to you. From my point of view, I mean, the, the, you know, the uh, big hub of science and technology, Barcelona has the capacity to create, to be attractive for uh, individuals. And that's, I think, uh, has become a differential element. No? We have the, uh, the instruments, and the instruments for that are the big research centers. Barcelona has a, a number of research centers that are of worldwide quality. And, and this is essential because uh, to be able to attract talent, you need places in which people can work in a proper environment. You have the instruments, and, uh, uh, and uh, crea professors. So ICREA is uh, one of the instruments of the Catalan government to be able to attract foreign scientists uh, to work in, uh, in Barcelona. So we have some of the necessary instruments to, to do that. And the, the more you have, that is like, like the biblical uh, say, no? the more you have, the more you get. The more attractive is the environment because you can find other scientists, because you can find collaborations, because you can find the things you need to develop your research, the more people you will be attracting. And that becomes an auto-fulfilled prophecy. The more you promise to get, the more, the more you get, and the more things you can do. Uh, so that's, that's, that's because uh, 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 that's what makes possible the environment. The more the, the more diversity we have in terms of the origins of the people, the, the type of uh, basic training, the type of areas of research and the type of applications, the more big and small companies are working around this, this, this scientific environment, the more productive the environment is and the more innovative the environment is. I think that's, uh, that's very clear, diversity uh, is uh, a way is, is a fundamental component of, of the future, and Barcelona is doing is doing well in that, in being able to attract a diversity of uh, talents. So attracting talents uh, to a to a proper environment, I think, is something that uh, uh, is a, is, a, is a, a key for the future. All that has to be done in a social environment that is attractive at the same time, because a part of scientists and technologists and, uh, and entrepreneurs, uh, you need uh, people, Scient you know, uh, scientists are not only scientists. So you need a, 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 an environment that is nice, in this, uh, you can live, you can have your family and all that. Uh, and Barcelona has been so far doing, doing well on that, despite of the crisis and, and, the, and, the, and the problems. Uh, so that's uh, keep that uh, keeping that after the crisis, after the coronavirus crisis, I think is going to be one of the challenges to be able to maintain this uh, this environment, to be, be still able to attract people, to keep the, the the science and the technology running in the city. Uh, I think is is a fundamental challenge and uh, is a fundamental challenge for the world of the of the humanity and the society, but it's also a fundamental economical problem because uh, this is one of the motors of the economy of the city, and we have to keep it like that. Okay, still waiting for, for Emilia. Uh, what do you think, Laura, about this, this question? What's your answer? Well, I think uh, we know science cannot be do isolated, so we really are now in science, everything has to be in a multidisciplinary approach, and we have to collaborate everybody. And that's the reason why we normally work on this European project, because we need, really need the expertise of different people put together and then try to develop something very good for the society. So I think especially here, what we have, as I said before, here in Barcelona is a special place because we have all this uh, requirement where we have so many people working on high level science. But at the same time, for example, we have also 
very motivated clinicians. So in all the hospital here in Barcelona, it's not only that they are doing just treating patients, but also they are really, really involved, for example, uh, in the science and also in the development of all of everything. Um, for example, now in with this confinement situation, we are facing some problem with the transport of the sample of the products or whatever uh, in the project. So this is also good because we are here in Barcelona and then even even if they are not connected, to, for example, in my my own project, but then I can connect with all my colleagues for the, the hospital, from other institutes, and then I can ask her, uh, them for the for the help. And if the, this can be done only here because we have all these surroundings, marvelous surroundings, and marvelous people working, and then it's possible that you can supply. I mean that you don't have this access now to the other people in Europe, and then you can done everything here because we have created. Uh, since many years ago, it's not something new, but many years ago, this ecosystem and now uh, this, I think in this situation of pandemic, it's very good to have everything concentrated here because then we can go faster in the development of anything that we, not, we need to now in science. I would like also to say that uh, probably after this pandemic, people is paying too much attention now to science. And you know that normally, I mean, the science, I mean, nobody is paying so much attention to science. And finally, uh, even the politicians now are just waiting that we found the solution, as I, as I also said before, like a miracle, mm -hmm. we cannot do miracles. Uh, but it's, it's also good that now they realize that they have a very strong uh, scientific system uh, here in Spain and here in, in Barcelona. They are recognizing that. And then it's also very good that uh, finally all our efforts that have been building this uh, since many years, uh, building every, I mean, just yes, not slowly, but uh, really, really with a lot of effort from many people. And now it's uh, a way to that people can see all our efforts and how important is science and to listen to the scientists. So I really hope that uh, this innovation ecosystem helps also to, that the politicians finally listen to us and then listen how important it is to listen to the scientists and the prediction of the scientists. Okay, thank you. Maybe it's time to move to the questions by our our audience. We, we will start with the question by Bea Pino, a very interesting question. Uh, she says that uh, the world is applauding uh, China for the discipline of its people. China's response was an homogeneous one, characterized, characterized by a centralized state control. Does the role of global cities fit in a model like that? Is it useful? It's open with Yeah, I want to say I, I agree so much. I think that China has the the impression from the outside, from very far away, that it is absolutely centralized, that they tackle everything, that they geoposition everything. Well, I don't think it's, it has been exactly that way. I mean, in China, you had all these apps, and then in this app, you had uh, locations where you had the uh, semaphore code, mm -hmm. and then you enter or not. And this has been the responsibility of many individual people. It's true that, uh, uh, in a way, the Chinese culture is very responsive to be disciplined, uh, to the discipline and so on. But it's also true that they have digital infrastructures that we don't have that they have things like WeChat Pay, Alipay, that they use a QRs, it very widespread everywhere. And for them, it's immediate to use them, and for us, it's not. And they can take advantage of, of QR. For example, in China, they have not been using geolocation. They have been using only QR, which is completely different from other places, because geolocation is complex. It's not accurate. It's not. And many of the things that we put in China to the big government that play a role, for sure, for sure, I don't deny that. It, it, it's, these are things that correspond to individual people, that they just don't want to be infected. They just don't want people that enter into these small villas that they have uh, infected and infected every... So it's a mix. So I would say, I wouldn't say that the model that we think China is, is the reality of China. It's exactly the reality of China. I think there is a distance. Thank you, Esteban. Now we have a question uh, which is linking uh, our current crisis with uh, the climate change uh, crisis. Uh, the question is by Jenny Cleaver, 
and she's asking, uh, there has been a lot of talk about the positive effect of social distancing, distancing on the environment. Uh, how will this new data influence uh, climate change policies now and in the future? Maybe it's for you, Alfonso. <laughs> yes. Alfonso? Alfonso? Uh, it, We're not lucky just, today with the connection. He just, he just disappeared. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you, uh, Laura? Or, no, not. Well, we can move to, to the next one and wait for Alfonso. Now, just a small comment on that. Uh, we just are starting a, a, a project about uh, uh, the, the implications of this crisis for pollution. Uh, because this mm -hmm. has been an incredible natural experiment of how a city without pollution can be. So Alfonso is back. I think that he can say more things yes. than I can. Well, I yes, you're about your the Department of Air Science in the Barcelona Supercomputer Center and they are, as you were saying, exactly, uh, starting project to evaluate what is the short-term and the long-term impact of the of this uh, of this period. It's amazing that uh, such a short time, uh, a few weeks, has produced already a such a mass visible effect at the global level. They are estimating that this is going to really have a a direct impact in the climate in the future. So that's, uh, uh, I mean, still calculations are going on because this is uh, unpredicted, unpredicted and it's, uh, they have to incorporate this in the, in the, in the models of the global uh, weather. But the, 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 what we see right now, what they are telling us right now is that this is going to have a, a visible impact in the climate in the near future. What is a very telling thing because that's also mean what do we, we know that we should do things uh, in the future, not as extreme as probably as we are now, but uh, that they, they are, they are intervening on the social environment can really have a very clear effect on the global warming. So I think that this is a positive, a positive lesson. It's not impossible to revert the cause of the of the global warming, uh, and this is a, a good demonstration that this can be done. Now the question is to do this in a more moderate way, obviously. Yeah, of course. We have a question by Emmanuel Gardan. She says uh, she fully agreed that this crisis is a unique opportunity for a structural change that cannot be missed. However, at the local level, she says. Uh, how will local institutions, uh, which which uh, some of them will have lost millions of euros in this crisis, such as universities, be in capacity to undertake these changes? Maybe now for you, uh, Laura. Well, I think that uh, depends. I mean, how long is going to be standing this uh, pandemic? Uh, because this is well, imagine that uh, in two or three months everything disappear. And perhaps people will start to forget very, very, very quick huh, about what has happened, and then uh, they are not going to take into account all the lesson that we are learning just now. So this is one thing. I mean, unless I mean, if the pandemic is uh, extending for a long time, well, well, I hope not, but uh, extending more time, then probably the lesson that we are learning now we are having our memories, and then we can also uh, make a reflection on, on that. But of course, I mean, uh, this is something that we should try to push and um, forward to, to try to keep all the lessons that we learn here and how to transform all this in a, in a better, I mean, a better uh, environment. Alfonso wanted to say something. Uh, I think we, I mean, we know now in a critical moment because the, the, the measurements are going to be released. Uh, we don't know exactly how, but very soon. And uh, this is going to be it is it's a it's a full experiment because we don't know uh, what are the consequences and it's difficult to predict the consequences. Uh, there are different models, but models are models. This is going to be affecting the economy, and uh, as you say, there are institutions that are in a critical in a critical state. And uh, if the crisis lasts long, they will be in a worse state. At the same time, how these measures, the, the current measurements, are going to be released is a very difficult situation. And again, uh, science and data are going to be essential to monitor the situation and to adapt. And one of the factors is obviously economy. Uh, the, uh, we cannot continue with like, for a very long time. 
how we are going to release the measurements to keep the economy going while we keep the, po the population safe uh, is a big challenge at the, at the technical level, at the scientific level, and at the political and social level. Cities have a, a lot of to say on that, because even if there are going to be general measurements, how these are going to be implemented in a city, in Barcelona, is very much a question to the city and to the population of the city. Mm -hmm. We have also a very interesting question by, by Maurizio. It's, it's, a, it's a question about something we journalists are facing uh, these days and it's real difficult to, to, to cope with it. Uh, the question is for the first speaker, so Esteba, I think it was Esteba. Uh, the, the question is, is, is this, uh, the possibility to compare data is also a problem. Uh, the, the data we, we try to compare coming from different countries are, are not so easy to compare because they are measured in very different, different ways. Is this a manner to discourage a, a global solution and can, how can we deal with it? Well, I completely agree. I mean, uh, journalists and um, everybody, we're having a, a tremendous <laughs> hard time because uh, how many people died? The, a simple question like this, it's impossible. Impossible to say because it depends on the country, it depends on the location, it depends on the city, it depends on what do you mean by dying by COVID or not. And not only that, many other questions. But the good news is that we are aware of that, is that people are talking about that is that for one time in many, in many years, we don't talk so much about ideology. We talk about what is happening and we talk what is happening with data in our hands. And this makes a huge difference than talking only about our ideas and our ideas are abstract and of course they don't need to be implemented and an idea that doesn't need to be implemented always flies, always works. But then when you have ideas that have to be implemented, have to be backed by data, it's different. So we are seeing this, maybe this other side of the politics that we normally don't see. We normally see politics that jail all day long and talk about ideology all day long. And now for the first time, we see the politicians that have to be managers and have to be good managers. And that's the new thing, that the, the issue of data it's on the table, it's good. We have a, a, a question which is uh, about politics and so feel free to ask. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it comes from Rosa Bagda. She says that some politicians seem to be blaming cities for the spread of the, the virus for political reasons. reasons. And she gives the example of Hungarian leader Viktor Orban, who challenges the, the, the Budapest, Budapest, the, the capital, because the mayor of Budapest belonged to a to an, a, an opposition party. Uh, do you think this is dangerous? This is the question by the question by Rosa Bagta. Uh, Afonso. <laughs> Obviously, uh, well, what can we say? Obviously, political decisions that are taken by political reasons and not for uh, good, well-informed reasons are always a very bad thing. We are, uh, uh, we see how all this technology that we thought was going to be for the wealth of humanity is now being used for spreading uh, fake news and for, uh, you know, uh, all kind of manipulation of the, of the opinion. That is a very dangerous thing that is going on and it's very difficult to stop it and is used for all kind of uh, illegitimate, I would say, political reasons. And it's obviously going to be dangerous uh, for people. We, we have seen the previous to all that, the big anti-vaccine uh, vaccine, uh, campaigns, uh, what are completely ridiculous from any scientific point of view. But the, at the same time, are not only dangerous for the people that don't want to get the, the kids uh, vaccinated, but also dangerous for everyone else. So I think that the, the, we have a big role to do in uh, fighting all the fake news and fighting all the policies that are based on fake news. And there is a question by Miguel Reyes to, to all the panel. Which kind of abilities people should learn about science diplomacy? Not only for this case, but uh, 
to be um, preparated to another problem uh, in any topic beside this one. Maybe you, Alexis, <laughs> even if you are not a panelist. <laughs> Um, some insights later, sure. <laughs> well, I think the main main lesson is to, I mean, the main way to do that is collaboration. And also, I mean, collaboration and collaboration, because uh, I know that in many countries, uh, people are trying to work isolated and people try to say, okay, this is only mine and I want to be the first in doing that. And I think the only way to go forward, I mean, I mean this is one lesson that we can learn from this pandemic is we, ha we need really really to collaborate with each other and then to share our results to share our ideas and to try to do everything together i mean it's i think the main is this is the main the main message that we we need the collaboration between even the the more i mean the best people and the people that can have um, can uh, give the best the best idea and i think this is one of the main messages we need really really collaboration between all of us especially between the scientists yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's 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 pretty obvious. And in, in some disciplines, I don't know, for example, I work more in, in machine learning and so on, and you have a huge culture of open source. But in many other disciplines, you don't have this culture of open source. You don't publish the code. You don't publish the Jupyter notebooks everywhere. And this is not a requirement to get things accepted and so on. Also, you have huge interests of companies, in this case, pharmaceutical companies that are in the middle and so on. This crisis puts on the table the need to change that and the need to change that to into different structures. How, probably, we don't know, but we know that has to be changed. Alfonso, want to say something about this? The same thing. Uh, collaborations, open science is essential for progress and the participation of society. I think that we have seen all uh, how important it is to get science uh, into the public and how to get people involved in, uh, in the scientific developments, in the progress of science, all these open doors in the different institutes, all the efforts to communicate science involving uh, uh, people in, in development of science has become a very important instrument for, for keeping things going and also for uh, explaining all these issues with uh, how we do things, how the time we need to do things, and the instruments and the data we need to do, to do progress. We have another question about data, uh, which seems to be a hot uh, issue this, these days. <laughs> uh, the question is by Salva Guardiola. And he is asking, how far should we go in sharing, in sharing private data for the sake of public health in this context of epidemic? Is it possible to ensure that companies dealing with this data will not exploit it only for their economic benefit? Hmm. Well, uh, we have the first models that have been deployed on the use of data that are the Asian models. They don't care so much. And then the problem that you have is that you need to first inform the people, the person who is infected, that they have been infected. Uh, you have also to inform uh, all the chain of contacts that have been in touch with this person that they are infected and you have to isolate them. So this aggregation part is the part that you need kind of a central, uh, a central authority or a central repository of this data. Uh, all the Asian uh, apps and so on do that with, with having the government keep the data and, and that's it. And that's, that's a pretty easy thing. And then the government informs any of these contacts and takes care of the measures to isolate them and so on. Also knows where the pandemic is, is this very expanded or not and so on. Now we have to, some more efforts. We have an European effort and we have an American effort that try to use peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks uh, and encoded. Some of them are encoded, some of not, with, with blockchain-like technologies that uh, well, that they do the same thing without the need of the government to know uh, who is uh, the person infected and how this is going. These, are, these efforts are under development. So both are possible. It's not absolutely necessary that the government knows uh, everywhere. At the point, it has to be an authority that can isolate this person who is infected and make sure that this person is confined. That, that you need, and you need the chain of context. 
But you also need, you also can do social regulation, you also can do many other things. So there are many ways to do it. We have another question, maybe this Alfonso one for... wanted to say something, I think. Okay, okay. sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. You know, this data is my, my, my... I want to say something about that. So, no, I mean, I agree, I agree perfectly. There is technology to deal with the privacy of the data, and uh, there is not the need of the government to know all what people are doing or to have all the data. But I want to give you one, one particular example in these days of crisis. We need the access to the medical uh, data of people. If we want to be able to calculate what are the what is the incidence of the previous diseases in the chances of having the, the infection or the, the, the degree of uh, the, the, uh, the infection, the cause of the disease. Without the previous the information of the previous data, it's impossible to, to do these predictions. These are uh, these are holding the medical in the medical record, securing the hospitals, and they are very secure in the hospital. It's very difficult to access to this information. Obviously, we don't want to put this in the open for everyone to, to get this, but there are many technical ways of moving this information in a reasonable way in which it can be explored. If we don't do these explorations, we are never going to solve this problem. Uh, we need to access the data. There are technology to do that, but without the data, there is no technology that is going to solve the problem. So, and this is a practical problem now, and I tell you, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it's very complicated to access any of this data. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is just bad, we are losing time. We have a, maybe it could be the, the last question because it applies to all of us as uh, scientists. Uh, it's by Beatriz Urda, and she's asking us, uh, scientists are working hard and mostly silently now, silently now. Incredible efforts uh, are being made. Now, do you think that we should stress now that science need, needs support and funding in the long term? Uh, that this is also important to address other crucial aspects and be prepared for future challenges? I, I think uh, all of you uh, are, are concerned about this, this question. Well, I can't. I can tell you just some, something really fa well funny is that um, with one of my collaborators in this European project, uh, the professor Jordi Serra from Barcelona University, so he's an expert in looking at this coronavirus in the in, in the bats and the rodents and so on. So we were uh, speaking for a long time, almost two years ago, about to find uh, financial support to do this point of care testing device that we're doing now, uh, just because we wanted to use to uh, make the surveillance of the coronavirus in the bats and the rodents and the animals and so on. And we didn't find uh, any, I mean, any way to get this financial support because in that time nobody cares uh, so much about the coronavirus and so on. It was more than two years ago. And now you see, I mean, and the, the importance that to make this uh, financial support because in that time we were working already two years ago in developing this uh, uh, biosensor, this point of care, this testing device for the coronavirus in animals. Probably we have had been much better prepared to do the analysis just now. So this is just an example how important it is to invest in science in many scientific domains uh, and also to be prepared and then to be ready for what could happen eventually in, in the future. So this is really, really important. I think this is also another lesson to learn uh, from this pandemic, that science is not only for one moment, but that we need a really, really strong scientific support for many years and to have a very strong scientific uh, system that can give them an answer when we really need, like it is happening now. Esteban? <laughs> No, it, I, yeah, I think the answer is in Spain votes one percent, one point zero one percent of the GDP uh, to Andy. Andy is not China. Andy is many, many, many things. Andy is administration. It's many things. So Andy is not China, but only one percent. The, the the average in Europe is three percent. The one who recommends uh, the European Commission is three percent, and this is an average. This is not to lead anything. This is just an average to stay online. So we are three times below the average. We have been like this for decades. I don't know. I mean, 
uh, I, I think we are saying that since ever. We can copy and paste of the articles of the yeah. uh, past 10 years, and they say the same, and the, the numbers are the same, and then nothing changed. No, no, there is no need to write anything more because you can use the, 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 previous, year, the previous year's article and works fantastically. I mean, countries like Japan and Korea, they, they spend three and four percent. If you want to compete with innovation, with one percent, come on, guys. I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's one plus one, one, it's two, not 11. I mean, it's, it's clear. If there is no money, the second question is how you spend the money. But if there is no money, there is no way to spend it well because there is no money. That's the situation in Spain. Also, on, top, on top of that, this, uh, the money that the government is putting into science in Barcelona, they say, is attracting more money, is attracting companies, is attracting talent, is building a full ecosystem. So it's not just spending money in science for the future, what is true and is needed, but it's also an investment in creating an ecosystem of companies, uh, jobs, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a full economy around that. So it has to be seen also at this level. Well, we have a very interesting chat going on in, in this side of my screen, but maybe it's time to, to ask Alexis to, to give the final speech, to say the last word about this webinar. It's been a pleasure to, to be with us, uh, the, with you this afternoon. Alexis. Thank you so much, Laura, Esteva, Alfonso, Emilia, who has to leave, and, and Miquel. Uh, as we saw today, if we want to understand the spread and control of infectious diseases, we have to look to urban ecosystems and infrastructures. Cities uh, can leverage the values of science, such as neutrality, universality, transparency, as diplomatic tools, especially in these difficult times where hard national borders and limited global mobility seem to be uh, growing trends again. The global challenges that cities are dealing with, including this pandemic, rise fundamental issues as to the future of public policy and, and, and global governance. That could probably be one of the main conclusions of today's conversation. We also saw how major cities are uniquely suited to make the most of this opportunity, as, as Esteba was pointing out, and translate their knowledge, resilience, and, and, and productivity into global progress. They are critical in implementing solutions to challenges that respond to a global logic, but are manifested at the local level. Equipped with uh, solid science and technology ecosystems, cities cannot turn a blind, a blind eye to humanity's greatest challenges. And we could dare to say that this is this is a time for city-led science uh, diplomacy. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that applications for our science diplomacy summer school are now open. This first of its kind one-week course to be held the second week of July in the city of Barcelona and organized by SciTech Diplo Hub, the Barcelona Institute of International Studies, together with other uh, leading institutions will allow you to get certified in science diplomacy and further into some of the topics we have been discussing for the last weeks and the ones we'll be covering for the upcoming uh, two online seminars. Thank you so much for tuning in today and please join us join and guess, and again next Thursday at the same time to discuss how our countries and cities in Latin America dealing with this pandemic and how could science diplomacy contribute to a better response in this region. If you haven't done it yet, don't forget to register. Thank you so much. Stay at home and stay safe. See you next week.